To demonstrate ESD testing simulation in XF, we have imported a multi-layer PCB and created a simplified ESD probe which will be used to excite the PCB with ESD waveforms at various locations of interest. The use of a simplified ESD probe is acceptable in this case because we are much more concerned with the electromagnetic fields and the currents generated on the PCB than we are with, say, the electromagnetic fields generated on the surface or the interior of an actual ESD simulator or gun. Once the geometry has been defined, material definitions need to be created and assigned to the geometric objects. To save time, this has already been done for this project. You can see here that the pads, surfaces, nets, and drills have all been assigned perfect electric conductor definitions, and this means that they will not be examined for dielectric breakdown during the simulation. On the other hand, the substrate has been given properties of FR4, and in this case, the dielectric strength of FR4 is approximately 20 megavolts per meter, which has been entered here. The, for materials that you do not wish to be examined by the uh, dielectric breakdown uh, algorithm, you would set them to have infinite dielectric strength by checking this checkbox, and that will mean that they will be ignored by the uh, detection algorithm and that it's essentially impossible for them to experience dielectric breakdown during a simulation. After completing the material assignments, the next key aspect of ESD testing simulation is, divine, is to define the ESD waveform. To do this, XF's user-defined waveform feature is utilized. Here we have imported a 15 kilovolt HBM waveform from the paper of Keenan and Rosie in uh, 1991. Uh, you can see here that it has a peak amplitude of about 75 amps and is approximately 100 nanoseconds long. Um, this waveform, the characteristics of this waveform actually are very important for setting up other aspects of our simulation, uh, so we will refer back to it several times. Now that the ESD waveform has been defined, we can create the ESD feed. First, to do this, we'll create a new circuit component definition. Um, <clears throat> called the ESD current source. We want this to be what we call a hard current source, which basically means that there's no source resistance. And we want the amplitude to remain at one because the amplitude of the ESD waveform is already defined by the waveform definition. Uh, so here you can see that we this is where we have assigned the 15 kilovolt HBN waveform to this current source. Now that we have the ESD current source def circuit component definition, we can now define the circuit component feed, which will be placed between the tip of the probe and the location where we want to excite the PCB. Uh, here I've already created this feed and it's simply in, uh, set to invisible, so I'm going to set it as visible. And you can see here that it's been connected to the tip and then to this trace pad on the uh, PCB here. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and then here in the properties of the circuit component feed is where you actually assign the component definition to the ESD current source. In addition to the ESD feed, you can see that I also have a number of passive components uh, defined, and this is to demonstrate XF's new rated component uh, capability. So first I will go into the 50 ohm resistor and I will assign it with a rated voltage of 30 volts I will we'll assign the inductor with a rated current of 0.44 amps and I will assign a, the capacitor with a rated voltage of 16 volts. All of these rated, rated component values can easily be found on the uh, component data sheets that are provided by the manufacturers. For any component that you leave with an infinite rated voltage or infinite rated current, uh, they will not be monitored during the simulation for over, over voltages or over currents. So here I have the actual circuit components all set to invisible, so now I will make those visible. Uh, let me zoom out and then I can show I basically just place these um, components at the end of these traces. And uh, th this is not uh, necessarily a real design. This is I, I've just placed these components here to uh, you know, demonstrate the new rated voltage feature, rated voltage, rated vol current feature. Now that we have the materials waveform and circuit components set up, uh, we need to define result sensors to obtain our desired ESD results. Uh, first, we'll define a, a planar E-field sensor uh, to obtain electric fields on the surface of the PCB. 
Um, here, the surface data definition, the surface sensor definition has already been defined ahead of time. This is collecting transient E fields uh, with an end time of 20 nanoseconds and then a sampling interval of uh, 500 times the time step. Um, and then once we have the definition defined, then we can come into the near field sensor and create a new uh, planar sensor. We want this to be with a normal in the Z direction. And then we can actually uh, place it on the surface of the PCB. So to lock that to the center and then there. And then here you can see that the service sensor definition has already been defined um, a, a, uh, associated with the near, near field sensor. So while that, that the transient E fields on the surface of the PCB, you know, they, they, they provide a very interesting uh, insight into how the fields are propagating and the currents are propagating uh, on the surface of the PCB, uh, but that they do not necessarily give us insight into um, locations of where a dielectric breakdown is likely to occur. So to obtain that result, uh, you actually create a, we have a new near field sensor uh, called the dielectric breakdown sensor. Here, this we already have one defined, and the properties of this sensor, you actually, this is very important to set your free space dielectric strength. Uh, so basically, this defines the dielectric strength for everywhere in the simulation where you have free space material. Um, in this case, the default is 3 megavolts per meter, which is the dielectric strength of air at uh, sea level. Um, this value, uh, while the, in most cases that value is going to be you know, sufficient, there may be you know, special circumstances where you want to consider the relative humidity of air and maybe you will need to change the dielectric strength in that case. Or maybe you're doing testing for, um, say, you know, a space environment and in that case you would actually want to enter the dielectric strength of a vacuum instead of air. Uh, also, then you can define the bounding box of the dielectric breakdown sensor, and uh, this is also very important because you, you want to achieve as much computational savings as you have. Uh, monitoring the whole simulation space for dielectric breakdown can be a little ex computationally expensive, uh, so generally I usually start by I um, set the bounding box of the sensor to that of the geometry, and then I come in and fine tune it uh, a little bit more specifically to the area I'm interested in. So in this case, I'm not interested in dielectric breakdown around the ESD probe, so I'm going to you know, zoom this in closer to the multi-layer PCB, uh, come down a little bit closer here. Uh, I can change my view, and really I'm just going to kind of make this as tight to my area of interest as I can uh, to get as much computational savings as possible. At this point, we have our project pretty well defined, uh, but we still need to set up our FDTD simulation settings. Um, first, to do this, um, we want our PCB and we want our probe to be grounded. So we're going to actually edit our outer boundary uh, conditions and we want to set the uh, minus Z boundary to be PEC. Now we need to define our FDTD grid. Uh, defining the FDTD grid for a ESD simulation is somewhat different than uh, uh, defining a grid for many of XF's common applications. Uh, the first thing we want to consider is the frequency range of interest. Um, since this is an electrostatic discharge, um, you're obviously in interested in a phenomenon that's occurring in static limit. And you can see that really you're defining your frequency range of interest by the ESD pulse that you're inputting into the uh, system. And in this case, you can see that there's really no high frequency content in the waveform. Uh, so uh, all of the frequency content is very down approaching DC. So we're not, uh, what that means is we're, the FDTD grid is not going to be um, defined or limited uh, based on the frequency range of interest. It's more going, um, the much more important aspect of the project in finding the grid is making sure that you adequately represent all of the geometric detail of the device under test. So now I'm going to come into the FDTD grid settings. And since we are not using a frequency range of interest in this case, um, our program, our ProGrid optimized gridding algorithm actually uses the frequency range of interest to, you know, uh, help with its automatic meshing. Um, so that's not really going to be of use to us here. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to turn that off. And we're just going to start by using uh, one millimeter uh, target grid cells. And then another thing we, we, we want to do is we want to come over to the extents and 
if you recall, I said that we want the PCB and the probe to both be grounded, and we have a PEC we have a PEC outer boundary condition in the minus E direction. Uh, so we want to go ahead and we want to set that to zero, and that will actually, um, you know, the probe and the PCB will be laying flat on that uh, minus E ground plane. And again, to, in, in in an effort to get as much computational savings as possible, uh, we really we don't need to have 20 cells of padding in all these directions. Uh, so in the in, we can we can really lower this down safely to probably about five cells of padding and in, uh, in, in all of these directions. And um, so at that point, um, we can go ahead and we can apply this. And you can see uh, only using 71 megabytes. Uh, uh, of uh, memory, so that's that's a really coarse mesh. Um, if we pop over to the mesh view, then I think what we're going to see is that this is not so. Just with the you know kind of one millimeter default cells, um, we're not going to be representing accurately representing uh, the PCB, uh, but by a long shot. So here, what we've done is I've I've come over and. Uh, I've actually used a local grid region um, defined on the PCB itself, and you can see that we're going much coarser or much finer here, uh, 0.1 millimeter x and y direction, 0.2 in the z direction. Then going ahead and applying that, um, we can see that this gives us a much more reasonable um, mesh uh, for the um, PCB device. Let me get up to the the top layer here, top traces, and then if you kind of zoom in on the mesh in this case, you can see that you know all your traces are getting you know adequately um, represented in the FDTD mesh. Um, so that that that's kind of the key to setting up a a mesh for the these ESD testing simulations is you're not necessarily working with a frequency range of interest. So the goal is really to have the cells as large as possible. Uh, while maintaining, you know, correct geometric detail of your device under test. And one of the real challenges with these ESD uh, simulations is that because of the fine detail in the geometries, and you have to use small FDTD cell sizes, which results in a small FDTD time step. And when you come back and you look at the source waveform, um, these waveforms relative to the FDTD time step are actually very long. Uh, and, and that's why it's really important to try to kind of squeeze out every every little bit of computational savings uh, that you can from when you, when you're setting up these simulations. So now we have everything to defined, and we're really ready to create our FTTD simulation. Um, so we'll come over here. We'll go to create FTTD simulation, ESD test, and like I said previously, these are a little bit different than our uh, standard XF uh, applications. Uh, so we're not doing uh, you could conceivably have a parameter sweep for one of these, uh, maybe where you are uh, changing the location of where you're exciting uh, the device under test with the EST pulse. But for this for this simple test problem, we're not going to be performing any parameter sweeps. Um, we're not we're not interested in S parameters. We're not collecting any steady state data. So really, the only the only thing that you really have to focus on is specifying the correct termination criteria. Um, so to do this. Again, you, you want to refer back to your um, ESD source waveform. And you know, from experience, typically dielectric breakdown or you know, the rated the rated voltages and currents being exceeded in the circuit components, it generally happens around the peak, you know, around the peak uh, of this uh, ESD waveform pulse. Um, so the, fir the first option you could have is you could just say, okay, I want to I, I want to actually allow the entire pulse to play out uh, for my F um, FTTD simulation. So in that case, you would set your termination criteria to just match the length of the pulse. So in this case, that would be 100 nanoseconds. As I said previously, in, in an effort to kind of squeeze out as much computational savings as possible, since most of the failures occur around the peak of the pulse, uh, you can come down and you could say maybe cut it in half simulate it out to 50 nanoseconds. Uh, for this test problem, I'm actually coming in even a little bit farther, and I'm going to simulate it to about 20 nanoseconds. Uh, that's going to give the this peak pulse plenty of time to kind of propagate through the device and show us points of uh, at risk of dielectric breakdown and uh, over voltages and over currents. Um, so, you know, after examining the waveform, you know, you can see here that I've come in and I basically am set I'm setting my termination criteria 
at, at the uh, simulation time of 20 nanoseconds. Um, we're not interested, so for these ESD uh, simulations, we're not interested in detecting convergence. Uh, it, it really all comes down to making to, to giving adequate time for that ESD pulse waveform to propagate through the space, and that's how we arrive at our maximum simulation time. Uh, so now that we have that set, we can go ahead and we can create our simulation. So now, in order to save some time, I'm going to jump over to results from a previous run. Um, let me zoom back out to capture the whole geometry. So we'll start by um, we save the transient electric fields on the surface of the device with the planar sensor. So we'll start by taking a look at that. Uh, click over here to sequence, and then we'll just go ahead and play that. It'll take just a moment for it to compute the bounds of the um, the result bar. So here you can see the pulse actually propagating from the pad uh, down the trace and then to this part of the um, PCB. Uh, so like I said previously, you know, this makes for kind of a very neat, you know, movie. It's neat to see how the fields propagate. Uh, you know, some interesting things you can see that you're actually getting some pretty high fields over in different parts of the PCB where, you know, maybe you wouldn't necessarily anticipate that uh, beforehand. So it does give some interesting insights, but just looking at this field movie, it really doesn't tell us, like, you know, exact locations of where we should be concerned about uh, dielectric breakdown occurring. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and stop this unload that result. Now I'm going to pull up the uh, new uh, dielectric breakdown sensor uh, result and this actually makes it much easier for an engineer to pinpoint locations at risk of dielectric breakdown. Uh, the first thing I usually do is since this is highlighting specific FDTD cell edges I usually come in and I change my size factor to uh, about, about five or so and that makes it a little bit easier to from a distance see locations uh, that have been highlighted. Now, what this is presenting, it's actually a time domain result. Um, so at this first sequence, um, each moment in time during the simulation that a cell edge either experiences dielectric breakdown for the first time, or if it actually has a higher uh, dielectric breakdown than it did in any previous time step, then that the result gets saved at that time step. Uh, so what we're seeing here is actually the first moment in time that a FDTD cell edge exceeded its dielectric strength. And so we can actually go and we can just zoom to the max field edge. And this kind of takes us in and shows us the first cell edge uh, that exceeded its dielectric strength. And in this case, you can see this is a Z-directed cell edge. So that's actually a free space. That's an air cell edge uh, that exceeded uh, the three megavolts per meter. Um, so there, there are a couple things of interest. You know, the first cell edge uh, seeing the first location that exceeded the dielectric strength is of interest. And then, you know, a lot of times it's actually pretty useful just to go ahead and just go to the last sequence. And then in this case, this gives you kind of a total history of all the edges that exceeded their dielectric strength and by how much. The value that's being uh, displayed here is actually the dielectric breakdown ratio. So this is the multiple um, of, how, of how far the dielectric strength was exceeded. Um, by how much the dielectric strength was exceeded. So, uh, you know, in zooming in and looking at this, it's actually interesting. You see that you have a lot of the Z-directed edges, which again, those are all air edges uh, being exceeded. And really what that would kind of represent in this case is, since that's air and since that's kind of going above the trace, you know, really that, that may be what you would see in, in a real ESC test is you might actually have a little bit of a corona a little bit of a corona breakdown that's happening above your trace. Um, for our case here, we're, we're really kind of more interested in getting, you know, potentials, uh, potential locations maybe between the traces uh, on the PCB that break down. So instead of showing all of the, um, every direction of the edges, we can actually choose to either show the X, Y, or Z. Um, so maybe if we click on the X, hit apply, th this result kind of is a little bit more informative to me. So you can actually see that you have a pretty high risk of actually having a dielectric breakdown between these two traces and you have a high risk of a breakdown coming between you know when you're actually making this turn and you can actually go all the way down to the end and you can see that you're you know you have some uh, far away from where you're actually exciting um, the PCB with the probe you actually see that you have some areas of high risk way down here
Um, and, and same thing with the Y direction. So you see that, you know, again, when you actually, you're making that, you're changing direction and your trace is right there and it actually uh, results in a in, an increased chance of dielectric breakdown. So, uh, you know, these results, this really, this really would help an engineer at a glance determine uh, locations where they may need to actually come back and revisit their ESD design. Uh, maybe these traces should be moved a little bit farther apart. Maybe there needs to be, uh, you know, a little bit of shielding or maybe a different material used in that area. Uh, so, you know, this new dielectric breakdown sensor, we hope, really helps engineers uh, at a glance determine locations at risk of ESD breakdown and will let them optimize that uh, maybe before actually developing um, their hardware prototypes. And finally, I'm going to pull up um, the rated component uh, results uh, from the uh, voltages and rated voltages and rated currents that we defined earlier. And again, this gives a you know a real quick uh, summary of all of the components in your simulation that actually exceeded their rated value um, during the simulation. So this, could, this this is a useful result for both you know ESD testing or even just some of the standard RF. Uh, RF simulations that you may be doing in XF um, gives the engineer a real quick summary of components that uh, you know are at risk of uh, experiencing permanent damage. So uh, they may need to to go in and maybe get a more expensive component with a higher rated value, or you know they need to go in and actually maybe reduce more of their layout design. Um, so with that, you know that concludes this uh, demo of our new ESD testing features. Uh, I hope it was informative.